know the characters, or else it makes no sense. And very few people can tell the Sadducees from the Pharisees, from the Essenes. It's all a very complicated story. During the reign of the Maccabee kings, now the Maccabees came to power in uh, 165 BC. The Jews were in the control of the Syrian Greeks and King Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes meaning a manifestation of God, which indicates how he, what he thought of himself, declared himself to be a god and insisted that all his people worship him. Well, they didn't care because they already had a dozen gods, why not add another? And he ruled the whole Middle East, but he also ruled Judea. And the Jews, of course, were focused on the one true God. So when a statue of Antiochus arrived in the temple courtyard, there was a Jewish rebellion led by Judas Maccabeus, one of the great military heroes the Jews have produced over the centuries. Joshua was a great general, Judas Maccabeus, David, and now, of course, today the Israeli army is probably the most uh, skilled ar small army in the world. So when they need it, they become very militarized. So Judas Maccabeus led a revolution against the Syrian Greeks and actually won. Amazing, the way we won against the British in the revolution. The British were the greatest empire the world had ever seen, and we fought them and fought them and fought them until they finally said, ah, oh, the heck with it, and they went home. And we got our independence. Well, the Syrians fought for years, and finally they said, ah, oh, the heck with it, let them have their independence. And they withdrew, and the Maccabee family, Judas's family, set up a dynasty of ki Jewish kings. It was the first independent Jewish state since 586 when Judea fell to the Babylonians. Remember, the first Jewish commonwealth was 1020 to 586 BC. King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and their heirs ruled for those years. 586, the Jews were defeated by the Babylonians. The Jewish kingdom came to an end. They returned in 538 BC, reestablished Judea, but not as an independent country. It was a province of the Persian Empire. But then the Persians were conquered by the Greeks, and the Greeks were, were replaced by the Syrian Greeks, and then you had the revolution of the Maccabees in 165. The book of Daniel was produced during that time. And its message is, you trust in God, and he'll see you through. You throw the three Hebrew children into the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and an angel appears and saves them. Meaning, you Jewish armies of Judas Maccabeus hold out against the Syrian Greeks, and you'll ultimately win. God will intervene. And they did win. So from 165 to 63 BC, there was what we call the Second Jewish Commonwealth. If you go to Israel today, they will say that the present state of Israel, founded in 1948, is the third Jewish commonwealth. And they're very conscious that there were two earlier ones, the one of the Saul, David, and Solomon, and then the one of Judas Maccabeus and his family. They ruled for 100 years, and in 63 BC, all that came to an end when the Romans invaded the Middle East and swept Jewish independence and everybody else's independence away, and Judea became a province of the Roman Empire. Well. And that's what we find during the New Testament story. But during the Maccabean rule, a group of purists, very pious Jews, were disgusted with the Maccabee rule. It was too worldly, it was too Hellenized, too Greek, and they were getting away from Jewish fundamentalism. So those people calling themselves the Essenes, the purists, they were the, pure, the new and true Israel, withdrew from Jerusalem, went to the Dead Sea where nobody would ever follow them, the way the Mormons went to Salt Lake to be safe where nobody could follow them. And the Dead Sea is dead, believe me. I passed out when I visited there. There's no... Today we always say it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Well, you try the heat without the humidity and you pass out. That's what happened to me. The Dead Sea is the worst place I've ever been. Of course nobody would follow them. And the Essenes set up a monastery the only, the Jews have been around for what, since, since 1800 BC. 
together with the Hindus, the oldest religion in the world. They've only produced one monastic sect. The Jews believe in getting involved in the world and building the kingdom of God and the human community. But these people believed in withdrawing from the wicked world and establishing a monastic form of Judaism which would be pure. And it later had influence on Christianity, which we'll study in a minute. But those are the Essenes, and we'll talk about them. Then you had, we've talked about the Sadducees last week. The Sadducees were the ones who ruled in Jerusalem. They were allied with the Maccabee rulers. And even when the Maccabees fell, the Romans found it useful to work with the Sadducees. They were aristocrats. They were wealthy. They were the hereditary priests descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses, the first high priest, through Zadok, the high priest at the time of Solomon. And they ruled the state. The Romans ruled the state. But when they wanted to confer with Jewish leaders, they always conferred with the Sadducees. The problem is the Sadducees had become corrupt. And they bought the high priesthood. Every year, the Romans appointed a new high priest. And the Roman governor appointed the one who gave him the most money. They were all from a few priestly families. But around 150 BC, the Pharisees, the Jewish rabbis, whom we'll talk about today, declared that the Holy Spirit had departed from the Sadducees. And they were just politicians who cooperated with the hated Roman rulers. And they ran the temple. And in many ways, Jesus comes along and says they were, mis they were running it in a corrupt way. In any case, they ran it. And they, if you wanted to worship God according to the Sadducee understanding of Judaism, you'd have to go to the temple at least three times a year on the pilgrimage festivals, Passover and two other festivals, Pentecost and, and one in the fall, Sukkot, and offer animal sacrifices. So we talked about the animal sacrificial system last week, and they believed that the smoke that rose from the altar, and they were sacrificing animals constantly every day, uh, was the link between heaven and earth. They didn't care what people did at home in their daily lives, if you can believe it. They only cared about coming to the temple. This was the holy place. And if you did your duty by coming to the temple three times a year, or every Sabbath if you could, then you were doing your duty by God. So it was a very narrowly focused, highly ritualized religion. Not unlike what goes on in the Vatican today with processions and everyone dressing up and uh, very elaborate rituals. Jesus had no taste for such stuff and clashed with them in the last week of his life. And the high priest decided this guy who's breaking up the stalls of the people selling animals He's attacking the sacrificial system, which keeps the world alive. Therefore, he's got to go. Now, the high priest didn't have the power to kill anyone, but the Roman governor did. And ultimately, the Roman governor executed Jesus because he thought he was trying to establish himself as king of Israel, like the Maccabees. And it says over the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, or would be king of the Jews. That's why he was executed. But the high priest certainly cooperated. So that's the story of the Sad of Sadducees. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe in many of the pillars of later Judaism. They didn't believe in angels or demons. They didn't believe in heaven or hell or future life at all, because it's not mentioned in the first five books of the Bible. They only believed in the Torah, those five books. And they were concerned with keeping the sacrificial system alive at all costs. And if we have to accommodate ourselves to the Romans to do that, then we'll do it. Pharisees. The Pharisees were a completely different group. Now, the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, tends to see the Pharisees as Jesus' enemies. Now, that's a very questionable analysis. The Sadducees were Jesus' enemies, not well, they were the enemies of anybody who disturbed the temple system, and Jesus did. They didn't know about him to the last Monday of his life, and Tuesday he returned and gave a sermon against them. But once they found out that he was anti-temple, they were against him. But the Pharisees knew about Jesus through his whole career. The Pharisees were, unlike the parody of them in the New Testament, 
a progressive group. They believed in applying the laws in the Bible, the whole Bible, all of the books of the Old Testament, to the daily life of the Jew. Now that's what Jesus was after, except Jesus had no patience with rituals, he, and he was even stronger on moral law than they were, but he clashed with them. Every time he clashed with Pharisees, it was over ritual laws. At Sinai, as I said last week, the Jews were given a double law, 10 commandments, some of them ritual laws, honor the Sabbath day, some of them moral laws, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. And Jesus was very big on the moral laws. He even intensified them, but had little patience with the ritual laws. He just wasn't a ritually oriented guy. And the, of course, it was the Sadducees who had the great rituals, but the Pharisees also believed very strongly in the kosher laws. This you can eat and this you cannot eat. That's in the book of Leviticus chapter 11. And Mark says Jesus didn't, he declared all foods clean. But Mark puts it in parentheses. It's not clear that Jesus did that. But he certainly didn't think that the kosher laws were that important. Strict Sabbath observance. Jesus went to synagogue, says Luke, every Saturday of his life. So attending Jewish worship, not in the temple, but in the synagogue, and we'll talk about the difference in a minute, was part of his Sabbath observance. But a Pharisee and a modern day Orthodox Jew who followed the Pharisees would not use a flame on the Sabbath, would not work on the Sabbath, would not pick a flower on the Sabbath, would not do any violence to the creation, wouldn't tear a piece of paper on the Sabbath. Orthodox Jews still follow those strictures. And there are many things they can't do on the Sabbath. What you're supposed to do on the Sabbath is pray and read holy books and commune with your family and with God. Anything else is considered sin. And the Pharisees were Orthodox, that version of Orthodox Judaism. Now, there were seven branches of the Pharisees. Some of them as liberal as Jesus in his sayings. Hillel, the great liberal Pharisee, said the essence of Judaism is do not do unto your fellow what you would not have him do to you. Jesus said do unto your neighbor what you would have him do to you. What's the difference? He and Hillel agreed there are books which parallel Hillel's teaching, and he was slightly before Jesus, and Jesus' teaching. They're virtually identical. But the run-ins that Jesus had with the Pharisees were with the Southern Baptist Pharisees, because the Pharisees went from very liberal, where Jesus was on rituals, to very conservative, where the school of Shammai, there was Hillel and there was Shammai, there were two opposites. It's like the Methodist Church versus the Missouri Synod Lutherans. And both Christians, but very liberal to very conservative. And that's the range of the Pharisees. Now in the Gospel of Luke, several times when the Romans are trying to find Jesus to arrest him as a would-be king, the Pharisees warn him and he gets out of town. He doesn't want to be arrested till he's ready. So there, some Pharisees are his friends, and I would suspect those are the liberal Pharisees. But unfortunately, when the Gospels were written, the Sadducees had already disappeared. And in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed by the Romans, and what a tragedy, it was one of the wonders of the world, they burned it, and it was gone. And the Sadducees, who could only practice religion in the temple, and in the temple courtyard where they offered the sacrifices, cease to exist as a viable active sect. Therefore, when the Gospels were written, beginning in 71 AD, Mark, and, and then Matthew, and Luke, and John, it's the Pharisees who were attacked. Although the Pharisees had no role whatever in Jesus' death, the blame is put on them. Now, the, what happens in the Gospels, and it led to 2,000 years of Christians persecuting Jews, is that the early church that produced the Gospels had a double outreach to Jews to bring them into the new movement and to Gentiles, which just means everybody except the Jews. Now, if they're trying to convert the Roman world and the Jewish world, they've already tried with the Jews. Now, all the early Christians were Jews. Jesus, his 12 disciples, 
three out of the four evangelists, Luke was a, a Greek, but the rest were Jews, and all the authors of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, are Jews, and the early church was a Jewish church. It was a branch of Judaism that called itself Jews in Christ. But by the time the Gospels were written, the last third of the first century, it was clear to the church that Jews had stopped converting. They had a viable, active religion. They saw no reason to leave it for a new religion. But the Roman gods were not worshipped anymore by anybody. And this was the moment for the church to convert the Roman world. And they were having increasing success, even to the extent of adopting Roman gods as local saints and taking on Roman practices as opposed to Jewish practices. So as the church had a Jewish root, it soon grew beyond that and became a Gentile movement. And if you want to convert people, you don't do it with vinegar. You don't accuse them of murdering God in Christ. You blame the Jews because they're not going to convert anyway. And since they didn't accept, the Jews never rejected Jesus during his lifetime. When Jesus says to Peter, who do men say that I am? Meaning, who do my fellow Jews say that I am? He said, most people think you're a prophet. And that's what the Jews thought. That's a very glorious, very high term. Those people, those Jews who knew about Jesus, and remember, 80% of the Jews lived outside of Palestine, could never have heard of him. Of the 20% who lived in Palestine without mass communication, very few could have heard of him. But those who did clearly supported him and viewed him as a prophet. And when the high priest wanted to arrest him on, Monday, on Tuesday of Holy Week, he couldn't because of Jesus' support by the local people in Jerusalem. So he was very popular. But what the Jews rejected was the church's claim, which wasn't made for some time after Jesus' death, that Jesus was God. And that sounded to them too much like Caligula and other Roman emperors saying they were gods. And Antiochus Epiphany saying he was a god. And that's what the Jews rejected. Not Jesus, but the idea of that Jesus was divine. All right. Well, Jesus interacts with the Pharisees constantly. And in most of the Gospels, with the exception of Luke, those are negative interactions. And it's a distorted picture because it just means one particular branch of the Pharisees. But since there were no Sadducees for the Gospels to attack, they didn't come into the picture till the last week of Jesus' life, the Pharisees get a very bad press in the New Testament. Now, if you want to know about a religion, you don't go to the text of the religion that replaced that religion. Christianity saw it itself as a replacement of Judaism and bad-mouthed the Pharisees in a very unfair way. The Jews saw themselves as a replacement of pagans, and in the New Testament, the pagans get a very bad press. Oh, those stupid pagans, they worship hunks of stone and wood. No, they didn't. The pagans worship nature, and the statue was a symbol of Mother Earth or Father Sky or the river or the mountain. It's not so crazy to worship nature, especially in the Middle East where the sun, the most prominent thing in the sky, is shining down on everyone and giving them life. That people worship the sun both in Mesopotamia and Egypt is not a surprise. But the Jews came along and said, we have something better. God is a spiritual reality beyond the sun and the moon, a transcendent personal spiritual being. And they, so they belittled the pagans. But the pagans are not the stupid fools that appear in the Old Testament. If you want to know what the pagans believed, look at their literature, the Gilgamesh epic and the Enuma Elish creation story, and you find they had a very high religion. It might not suit us the way Judaism and Christianity do, but it wasn't primitive and it wasn't stupid. So my point is, if you want to know about anybody, read their literature, not the anti-literature. So trying to find out about the, pagan, about the pagans, you don't read the Old Testament. You read their, their stuff. If you want to find out about the Jews, you don't read the New Testament. It's a distortion. Because after all, thought the evangelists, if Judaism was an adequate religion, why do we need a new one? So they had to compare the worst of Judaism with the best of Christianity. And so if you want to know about Judaism, read the Old Testament and read Jewish 
rabbinic literature and you'll find out an accurate picture, not in the New Testament. Any questions, comments? Anytime, just raise your hand. All right, so there were no Sadducees when the Gospels were written, so the Pharisees take the brunt. Who were they really? They were educators, teachers, rabbis of common origin. They weren't aristocrats, they came from the people. And they were strong in the countryside and connected to synagogues, not churches, not the temple. The temple was the center of animal sacrifice and highly ritualized religion run by the Sadducees in Jerusalem. There was only one. Today, if you ask a Jew where he worships, he'll say a temple or a synagogue. It's an interchangeable term. But in those days, it was not. The temple was one kind of institution of the Sadducees and their animal sacrifice. The synagogue was what synagogues are today, what churches are today, where you go to pray and read the Bible and sing hymns. And the Jews would do that sometimes every day, certainly on Saturday, often on Monday and Thursday, which were market days, and they came to the synagogues and they read the Bible and had their services in the morning. But the Sabbath observance, which Luke says Jesus always participated in, uh, and we see him at synagogue several times, was that was the synagogue going, and the synagogue was the Pharisee institution. Local houses of worship, just no bigger than this, but they looked very much like this, except the seats would be on either wall, sort of bleachers coming down, and the platform here would be in the middle, and they would read the Bible and lead the hymns and all that. Jesus would recognize an Orthodox synagogue today if he came back to earth. The service is virtually the same, except it's now three hours long. They've been accretions. The Orthodox Jews believe if it's worth saying once, it's worth saying six times. So they, lots of repetition. Uh, and it's all chanted in Hebrew and it's very beautiful. Uh, but it's very hard to follow, of course, if you don't know the Hebrew. If you want to visit a synagogue, visit the Reform Temple on Hazel Street. And by the way, I'm giving the sermon there fr uh, Friday night at 8 p.m. Uh, in honor of Carolina Day. And it's on the faith of the Founding Fathers. And if you're free Friday night at 8 p.m., go over there. It's at Temple Beth Elohim between King and Meeting, and you'll be most welcome. It's a beautiful Greek revival building. Been there since 1839. Only in Charleston could a building built in 1839 be referred to as the New Temple, because there was an old one there built in 1749, uh, and it burned, and they rebuilt it. But that's a reformed temple where the service is largely in English, and they would find it easy to follow it. Yes. Yes, Saturday morning, same sermon at the synagogue Emmanuel, but that's a Hebrew service. No, at, 11, at, at 10 o'clock at Temple uh, Synagogue Emmanuel in West Ashley, which is a very hard place to find. So if you can go Friday night at 8 o'clock, that's the time to go. Because you won't be able to follow the service at Synagogue Emmanuel. You might find it interesting, but it's a three-hour service without a word of English. So I don't know what you can get. The Hebrew prayer, the pre prayer book has Hebrew here and English here. So they announce pages, and anybody who doesn't know Hebrew can follow it in English but still the service is long and it's in Hebrew. Uh, so uh, it's a better bet for you if you're free Friday night is the Reform Temple, which is highly uh, anglicized and it's an hour service. An ancestor of mine, uh, Isaac Harby, stood up at the congregational meeting in 1824 on Hazel Street and said, uh, why don't we pray in English? We're Americans. Why don't we take out the repetitions, and the three-hour service will become a one-hour service. And why is the sermon in Portuguese? Our ancestors were Portuguese, but nobody here knows Portuguese. So let's have an English sermon. And the temple changed in 1839. They put in an organ, which is unique in a synagogue, and uh, now they have a very Americanized, uh, anglicized, shortened service. And it's very nice. Each, I like both of them. I go to one Friday night and the other Saturday morning, and then I come here on Sunday, so I'm a, I'm a liturgy. I like liturgy better than Jesus did. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the Pharisees were ordinary people who studied and studied and studied. Most people couldn't read. Most people couldn't write. Well, a lot of Jews could read because you had to be able to read the Torah, the Bible, 
in order to be a good Jew. So uh, they, they achieved uh, very high literacy for males. They didn't bother educating women, of course. And they couldn't write, though. And the Pharisees were scribes. They would copy the sacred books by hand. Their institution was not the Jerusalem temple, but the local synagogue. And instead of animal sacrifice, they had prayer, repentance, righteousness, study, observance of the law, kosher laws, Sabbath laws, and rituals in the home, Sabbath meals. It was a, a, a relatively modern religion compared to the Sadducee religion. They were totally non-political. They opposed the Romans, of course. But as long as the Romans didn't f interfere with the practice of the religion, they were willing to live under the Romans. And as long as they could preserve the sacredness of the Bible, and wh whereas the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the Pharisees accepted the Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Ezekiel, and the others. And there are, what, 12? I think 16 prophets. And then the writings, the, the historical books, uh, the Book of Kings, the Book of Chronicles, all of that. So the Old Testament as we have it, and it's 39 books, those, that was the Bible the Pharisees accepted. So they won out. The Phar Sadducees were wiped out with their temple, but the Pharisees continued. And, of course, they began to produce something called the Talmud. During the first five centuries after Jesus, the Talmud was produced. First, they produced the Mishnah, the Midrash, which is a collection of stories about biblical heroes that aren't in the Bible, but are in the Midrash. For example, the Bible tells us in chapter 12 of Genesis that the Lord said to Abram, Lech lecha me'artzecha mi'bet avicha. Go forth from thy land, from thy father's house, and I will show you a, la a new land. I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and all in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. So Abraham took the message of ethical monotheism, and out of that has grown Judaism and Christianity and Islam, the three Abrahamic faiths. But... What was Abraham doing before God spoke to him in chapter 12 in 1800 BC? We don't know from the Bible, but the Midrash adds this story. Abraham's father was a manufacturer of idols, of statues. And he went out to lunch and he left little Abraham in charge of the idol showroom. And at that moment, God spoke to him. And said, now it says in the Bible that he was a, uh, an old man or a middle-aged man when God spoke to him. But the Midrash says, no, he was a kid. And his father left him in charge, went out to lunch. God speaks to him, I am the one God, and all these hunks of stone don't mean a thing. So Abraham took a club, being a precocious child, and he smashed all the idols except the biggest one. And he put the club in the hands of the biggest one. And Daddy came home from lunch, and he said, what happened here? This is my livelihood. Uh, somebody destroyed all my statues. And Abraham said, well, they had a fight, and the biggest one killed all the others. And his father said, what are you talking about? They're just hunks of stone. He said, then why do you worship them? So that story's in the Midrash. Clever. So the Midrash is a supplement to the Bible stories. Wonderful miracle stories, all kinds of things going on. Then after producing the Midrash in the years before Jesus, the Pharisees produced the Talmud. The Talmud has two sections, the Mishnah and the Gemara. You don't have to know this, it's just of some interest. And it goes on volume after volume after volume. It has two elements in it. Halakha and Agadah. Halakha is law, laws for everything, hundreds of laws, how to observe the Sabbath, how to observe the kosher laws, how to do this, how to do that. It covers your whole life. When to pray, when not to pray, how to pray. But the Agadah section, that means story. 
if you search the Talmud, legalistic stuff, which can get, in my opinion, very boring to the modern reader, you find these wonderful stories. And the stories are like an enlargement of the Mishnah, all kinds of wonderful stories attributed to biblical characters which teach lessons. So today's Orthodox Jews will follow the Bible, the Mishnah, uh, the Midrash, the Mishnah and the Gomorrah of the Talmud. And then there were rab have been rabbis for the last 1500 years, because the Talmud was codified in 500 AD, who have produced commentaries on the Talmud. So if you open a Talmud, which not most people aren't likely to do, including most Jews today, but the Orthodox pour over it, you see a big folio, big page, in the middle you have Mishnah and Gomorrah, and all around here, commentaries. This is a commentary on this, that's a commentary on that, that's a commentary on that, and through the ages, the rabbis produce commentaries. So it's uh, an interesting study if you have the stomach for this kind of very, very dense and sometimes rather quirky literature. Most Jews focus on the Bible, but again, the Orthodox also love the Talmud. I haven't had much patience for it, but when I was at seminary, we spent a year at it, and for me, that was enough. Uh, all right. The daily observance of the laws, the rituals, and the ethics. They were non-political. They accepted the Torah, the five books of Moses, so-called, then the prophets, then the writings, and the Talmud, and all these other books. Of course, the Talmud hadn't been written in Jesus' time, but later on, they produced it. And the idea was to apply the law, ritual law, ethical law, to the daily life of Jews, not just going to the temple. Now, a lot of Pharisees went to the temple because they weren't prepared to argue against something that was mandated in the book of Leviticus, those animal sacrifices. But you can guess that a lot of Pharisees really didn't support the animal sacrifices, but they probably were intimidated because their high priest really ran everything not to not saying anything. So they either avoided the temple or went there just sort of going through the motions. But Jesus had the courage to attack it, as had Jeremiah, the great prophet 600 years earlier. And when Jesus was attacking the temple and turning over the stalls of the people selling animals, which would have made the animal sacrificial system impossible, he quoted Jeremiah. My house should be a house of prayer for all people. Was he suggesting that the temple be turned into a synagogue, a house of prayer, not sacrifice? I think so. Now, most people say what Jesus was doing was opposing the sale of religious services for profit, and that may be so, but there's a much deeper issue. If that was the issue, the high priest wouldn't have got exercised over it, but it's a much deeper issue. The deeper issue is he's attacking the temple system of animal sacrifice itself. That had been done by Jeremiah. And the high priest of his day, Pasher, beat him up and put him in the stocks, Jeremiah. But Jesus, I think the high priest conspired in his death. So you have two people who conspired to do away with Jesus, one Jewish and one Italian. But of course, it's the Jews who have been blamed for 2,000 years. The Jews supported Jesus and kept the high priest from arresting him day after day during Holy Week. And that's why he needed Judas to tell him where Jesus could be found when he wasn't surrounded by his adoring Jewish followers. And that's what happened. But to blame the Jews as a group because the high priest happened to be Jewish would be like blaming all the Italians today because Pontius Pilate was an Italian. And it's been the source of endless misery and persecution because the church didn't stop teaching that until 1965. Well, before the Protestant churches in 1945, after the slaughter of the Jews of Europe by the Nazis, began to say, maybe our teachings on the Jews and how they're guilty of killing God. No one else had ever been accused of such a thing. And our persecutions of the Jews, and Martin Luther was violently anti-Jewish in his old age. The Lutheran church has repudiated that now. Maybe that helped to bring on the Holocaust. Maybe that's how Hitler thought he could get away with it. And Hitler said, I'm just following the logic of church teaching. The Jews killed God. Nothing you do to them is war can be too terrible. And so he killed virtually most of the Jews of Europe. Well, the church began to think about this in 1945, 46, 48, 
and pass resolutions denouncing what had happened and then gradually saying, wait a minute, it wasn't just the Nazis. It was a lot of baptized Christians who agreed that the Jews were evil. And wait a minute, it's not just that. It's that a lot of baptized Christians were in Nazi uniform and helped to kill Jews. And wait a minute, it's not just that. It's that our teachings against the Jews for 2,000 years had prepared Europe for this catastrophe. We've got to get rid of the teaching of hate in the midst of the Christian religion of love. And the Protestants began it in the 40s. The Catholics picked it up in 1965. And the Pope said, the church is going to enter the 21st century without this anti-Jewish polemic.